So hi, I'm Zaylin Pesha. Um, I'm from the Australian Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Um, some of you might have known this as AusAid, um, but we've now um, had a change of name. So um, this session follows on from the earlier session, which is, you know, we, we very much highlighted the four issues that we see in gender and women's economic empowerment. And so I guess in this session, what we're really focusing on is actually bringing case studies um, to you. So we have five speakers. Um, I won't go through the detailed bios of each of the speakers because they're in your um, notes. Um, they will each have five minutes to um, have a bit of a, uh, an outline of um, what they see as, as main case studies. And then following that, we will have some um, questions from you guys. So um, if there's nothing more, we'll go ahead. So our first speaker is George from uh, Neumann Foundation. So I'll hand over to you, George. Thank you very much. Um, I'm George from well, Neumann Foundation, Hamburg, Germany. Um, Neumann Foundation has been established by um, the Neumann Coffee Group, Neumann Family, which is a green coffee trading and service group working worldwide. Um, and the, the, actually the reason why this group then established this foundation was um, that they were getting aware of the huge sustainability problems um, smallholder farmers are facing worldwide, while smallholder farmers, if you look at the potential for, for coffee production on a global scale, if you look at the, um, at the development of demand also on a, on a global scale, demand consumption, um, then the, the logical conclusion is that you have to look into smallholder production in order to, to develop this potential and at the same time improve the situation of, um, of these farmers so that they continue being interested in profitable and sustainable coffee production. So this work, this well, uh, foundation was established in 2005. Projects are being implemented in Latin America, Africa, Asia, um, and the, the the focus of this work, which is um, all of these projects, actually are public-private partnerships with coffee companies, coffee roasting companies from Europe, from the U.S., from Canada, um, and always in partnership with um, donor organizations, some of which. Uh, well, we, we are working with, or have been working with, are um, represented in this event. Um, the focus of these projects is really professionalization of smallholder farmers. They have to develop coffee as a, as a professional business. It has to be profitable. It has to be sustainable. So it's comprehensive professional training combined to the establishment and strengthening of farmer organizations, but with a concept of these farmer organizations developing into, um, into business organizations, um, farmer driven, farmer owned, and providing services which are relevant for the smallholder farmers. Now, um, how did we get to, to work on gender? Actually, as said, we are coming from a clear um, coffee focus um, and have been focusing on, on this professionalization, on, on strengthening of farmer organizations. Our biggest program um, for the time being is in Uganda, where we reach out to now 53,000 farmers, um, which are organized in, in relatively strong organizations already. They um, have managed to increase their income significantly due to the fact that from a system where they were um, selling the coffee at a very low price to a middlemen, a series of middlemen, they now managed to take the coffee to, uh, to the capital, Kampala, and selling truckloads directly to exporters. And that's what, it, what these farmer organizations now are doing on their own. And they are free, of course, to, to choose the, the exporter they would sell to. Uh, we saw that this income increase did not really, how to say, translate into an improvement of the livelihood situation of the farmer families. So we started to look into why this is not happening and, well, um, uh, saw immediately 
after looking more in depth into, into, this, uh, into these problems, that we have to develop a systematic gender approach in order to, um, to address the decision making within the families, within the households, and to, um, and to enable um, women to, to access resources which they need in order to be productive and to be able to improve the situation and the livelihood of the family. So we, so we, we developed um, a, a so-called well, gender household approach, adapted it to, to our methodology of working um, with the farmer groups and communities and, uh, and saw the, in, a, in a relatively short period of time, we started this work about three years ago, that, uh, that this was working, that um, from, from initial um, concerns about that this would not be accepted, um, we, we saw that this was totally different. Now the farmer communities, they are asking um, us to introduce this approach into their groups. We have been working um, with this approach already um, reaching out to 17,000 families and now we see that really um, livelihood, the livelihood situation is improving and the, the range of positive effects from, um, from this approach reaches from um, increasing economic performance of the farmer households because women do uh, a lot of the farming activities now they are motivated because they participate in the decision making on income generation and income use um, to uh, decisions about how to deal with health, with education, investments into the housing, investments into the farm itself and then of course um, combining um, professional um, coffee production with professional food crop production because we are talking about um, smallholder farmers which, uh, which have real um, diversified production systems, well, in this case, in Uganda, it's uh, the, the typical coffee garden. So, um, the, we, we, based upon this positive experience, we will take this experience or this approach which, which we um, have been developing in Uganda to, right now, to Tanzania, um, to a new project in, in Ethiopia and we are assessing also the, the um, introduction of this approach in West Africa, in Ivory Coast, where, where we are working with um, cocoa farming communities. Um, well, further challenges which we see um, are that we have to integrate this approach uh, into our M&E system. There we, well, it's really a challenge. We, we have to work hard on this. We have to combine this work, this gender um, approach, with um, an approach to, um, to professionalize youths about um, agriculture so that um, they really see agriculture and sustainable coffee production as a good business. We have started a pilot project and are now blending the youth work with the, with the gender work. Um, and well, another big challenge um, which we have taken on is regarding climate change um, of coffee and the food crops which are being produced in these um, coffee um, producing communities. So that's where we stand. Huge challenge, but um, we, we developed, how to say, we de de um, now we are convinced that we, we cannot do our work with, without this gender component and we have to develop it further and also get more women into these um, farm organizations which, which we um, have helped to, to be set up. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, George. Um, we now go to Rhoda from the International Center for um, uh, Tropical Agriculture who will be talking a bit about um, beans. Um, I'm Rhoda Zulu, I work for SEAT, uh, and I would want to share with you uh, this special crop, which is known as a woman crop. Uh, we have the Pan-Africa Bean Research Alliance, uh, which is a uh, research and development uh, network uh, facilitated by SEAT. Uh, our, our goal is to improve or enhance food security 
uh, income and health of uh, resource poor farmers as well as urban uh, consumers through research uh, on beans. Our main beneficiaries are women uh, who are involved in the production and post-harvest handling uh, of beans. So that's why it gets its name as a woman crop. And women prefer bean uh, production uh, because of a number of benefits, uh, early maturity. That means that they can have three to four crops in a year because it matures in less than uh, three months. And this means that they can have more food uh, for their families as well as generate the income that they need uh, for their uh, urgent household uh, needs. Also, all the, uh, a number of uh, physiological growth stages are eaten as food. When we look at the leaves, the green pods, as well as the, the grain itself, which means that they have food over an extended uh, period of time. Beans is nutritious. It provides uh, protein, as well as now um, micronutrient that we have the biofortified uh, varieties and also beans can be stored uh, for a long period of time and also it is compatible when it comes to production with other food, uh, food crops such as maize, uh, bananas and cassava. So despite all this actually beans is grown on a very small piece of land by women uh, because they don't have access to a lot of land. Uh, they use recycled seed and also they plant late because they have to first work into the man's field, uh, uh, planting uh, crops uh, which are normally cash crop, uh, like tobacco or cotton, which is not uh, even eaten. They also don't have time uh, for managing their own field. So they also don't receive any extension services and not even inputs. So as a result, they have very low yield. But despite all this, the little yield that they have, they will keep some for household food security. And they also sell a little bit uh, for the urgent household needs, especially salt, soap, and the kerosene for the light, really, it's on the woman uh, most of the, uh, the times. But however, this scenario is now changing. Uh, we are seeing this crop transiting from a subsistence crop into a cash crop. Why? Uh, through the Pan-Africa Bean Research Alliance, uh, the countries, uh, the national countries have released a number of varieties and these varieties are accepted by the farmers uh, because the farmers are involved in the selection process. And also the women, uh, they participate in this selection. So they are able to select uh, varieties uh, which are biofortified and also which are fast cooking and high yielding when it comes to, to the women. Obviously, the men normally go for the niche uh, class, uh, classes uh, for the markets. So we are seeing these changes. And also, uh, the consumption of beans is increasing. Uh, before, we were all aware that beans was known as a poor man's crop. Again, you can see when it comes to production, they will say it is a woman crop. When it comes to consumption, it is a poor man's crop. Uh, food. So when it's food, it's a man. When it is work, it is a woman. <laughs> but now it is changing uh, because of all these uh, diet-related diseases. Uh, even the elite now, they have been made more aware uh, that uh, bean protein uh, is better than animal protein. So you find that there is that demand among the elite classes uh, in sub-Saharan Africa which has led to the increase in consumption of beans. So coupled with the increased, um, uh, increased yield and increased consumption, we are seeing uh, this increase uh, in bean uh, demand, which will lead into in, 
uh, demand for production. So we are seeing this crop transiting from uh, subsistence into uh, cash crop. For example, in Ethiopia, uh, beans is known as white gold, and it is uh, listed on the stock market. Uh, in Rwanda, we have seen uh, Rwanda uh, moving from a net importer into uh, exporter uh, of beans. So really, with this transition, there are a number of questions that we are looking at. We are saying, uh, are there any differences in income and empowerment of women farmers in these countries where they have transited from uh, subsistence into cash crop uh, compared to where the countries are still uh, growing beans as a subsistence crop? And again, we are asking ourselves questions to say, will beans still remain a woman crop? Uh, because we have seen with other crops, when they become profitable, men take over. Is this going to be the case uh, for beans? Again, are women going to keep the beans for food security? Uh, are they going to sell everything? Again, we have seen with other crops where uh, when it's grown as a cash crop, they tend to sell everything. So is this going to be the case? And when the women sell the, the, the beans, are they, what are they going to use the money for? Are they going to buy more nutritious food? Are they going to invest it into business? And again, we know that women, when they have income, they spend most of their money on household needs. Then this has an implication if they are involved in the cash crop. It means they cannot grow their business. So they will need skills uh, in business and in, in entrepreneurship, especially that they need to form cooperative so that as when they are together as cooperative, they will be able to access other services, especially the extension services, as well as the uh, credit uh, facilities. We are also asking ourselves uh, questions whether uh, beans as a cash crop is enough to empower uh, these women. Are they going to be empowered? And again, we are saying uh, from the income that they re realize from beans, what will be the implication on their diet? Are there going to be changes in the preference of food? What will their diet be like uh, in those households where the woman has uh, increased uh, income? Again, we are realizing that markets, they have to be linked to the markets, and markets are very, very important uh, in food, I mean, now providing food security as well as uh, income. So we are again asking ourselves, are markets going to take away nutritious food or are they going to provide a diversity food and, I mean, a diversity food uh, that would lead into improved uh, nutrition or they will take away the nutritious food and repl replace it with non-nutritious food, uh, especially that if they sell the beans, which is more nutritious, then they end up buying uh, maybe fizzy drinks, uh, take, I mean, these uh, takeaways, which are less uh, nutritious. So our proposal for the intervention is to look at uh, the nutrition, market, and gender approach. Uh, we really would want to analyze the gender, do the gender analysis so that we have a comprehensive understanding of this transition from subsistence into cash crops. So we would want to measure uh, women empowerment using uh, some of these uh, tools and indicators, but also look at the nutrition, what will be the change in their diet, in their food preferences, as mentioned, as well as looking at markets, because we feel that now markets, especially when it comes into the urban areas and even in the rural areas, that uh, our countries also are slowly moving into urbanization, plays a very important role uh, for the household to access food and see whether it is going to provide a diversity diet or it's going to take away uh, the nutritious food uh, from these people. 
So what uh, I would say is that uh, I would really want to hear what are your approaches. Uh, some of you are doing similar work and it would be good for us to learn and uh, to see how it compares with Barbara's approach. Thank you. Thank you, Rhoda. Some really good questions there. Uh, I'll now go to Eleanor, who unfortunately had an insect bite this morning. Um, from Eleanor from the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, DCED. Yeah, sorry, I'm not um, falling asleep. I just uh, got a big mosquito bite. Um, uh, but um, so. I come from the Donor Committee for Enterprise Development, which functions quite similarly to this platform, really, in that we're funded by actually many of the same um, uh, donors, but our focus is really on the private sector. How can we uh, improve economic opportunities and jobs for the poorest people? Um, and I think, actually, this ties in really nicely from what uh, Rhoda was just saying, um, and also from the questions we had this morning about the invisibility of women's work and how they're often not tied into markets. Um, because one thing that we found, and there's a couple of case studies I will draw on particularly today, but it goes for a lot of research that we've been doing, um, is that just by tying women into a market for some small section of the work that they do can really change the value uh, which their contribution to the household is given. So it's somehow, I mean, to me, not so surprising that when a woman is mainly focused on um, helping somewhat contribute to post-harvest processes and so on, but they're not really considered the primary producers of that crop, and equally then they're providing a lot of food for their um, family, but they're not actually bringing in any money, they will be the ones that forgo the food so that the person who is considered the main income earner is able to go out and, and keep on working. Um, and so the particular example I wanted to make here, which is a really nice one because it was also a way of combining um, two things which I think are really important. One is, as we talked about earlier, the efficiency in women's work. And the other one is um, trying to work within systems so that we're, we're sort of and not confronting too aggressively, but working with what women already are doing, is um, it's called the Alliances Lesser Caucuses Programme in Georgia. Um, and what it mainly works with is women who are all involved in dairy production. So the men are responsible for cattle and um, the selling of meat, but women uh, milk the cows and they also make cheese from it. And that's mainly for consumption, and then the cheese gets traded a little bit as well as a sort of local currency. And just with very simple uh, interventions for veterinary training, service provision and so on, women realise actually it's much more efficient just to uh, create sanitary milk, which they can then sell on to factories and um, save themselves a lot of time in the process uh, and, well, have a real income, which they found very empowering when it comes to broader household decisions about nutrition. Um, more broadly, sort of what I want to talk about is how the role of really good market analysis and monitoring, am I doing okay for time, um, uh, can play into this. So, of course, market analysis is really critical for identifying which sectors or which activities women are involved in that we can try to um, use to bring out their, their sort of earning potential as such. Um, and they're also very interestingly helpful for leveraging the impact of um, these service providers, like in this case a veterinary provider, because whilst it's quite easy to make the business case, okay, we want, um, uh, this is coming from, you know, market development, private sector development perspective, uh, we want to make the business case that, look, there's all of these cows and they're not really being farm, uh, farmed properly and, you know, men will um, use your services if you come out into the villages. The service providers actually don't want to bother to include women because they don't see them as very critical in this aspect. And just with this market analysis, if you say, okay, we want 30, 40% of your beneficiaries to be women, and that, oh, you only get the contract if you do that, it can be quite a nice way to actually um, leverage this demand because there's so many quotes from the service providers now saying they're so happy because they actually think that women listen better to them, but they also realize that it's the women who are aware if the cows have mastitis and so on, really are using their services every day um, in terms of the milk production. The next part, of course, of market analysis is ongoing monitoring. Um, and this is sort of particularly something 
uh, I wanted to talk about because we've created a lot of um, monitoring gu guidelines around uh, looking at the household level, which I think is really important um, if we're going to you know, fully understand the, inter the very complex interactions that are going on here. And um, that can be really good for, firstly, so uh, we have some very practical ways of doing this and they don't take very long and they're actually quite cost effective. Um, but small household surveys can really help you understand um, what is the small unexpected things which are helping women feel empowered in your intervention. And we found, so in this intervention, they decided, okay, newspapers are a good way to spread agricultural information. It doesn't mean you have to have a high literacy rate because women talk amongst each other, men talk amongst each other. So they started having these agricultural um, inputs into a failing newspaper. And just by talking to the women, what they realized was what actually the women wanted was not so much the information, but exact um, stories about other women who had successfully scaled up their own production, which they could then just literally copy because they were really lacking in confidence in how they could do this, even though the services were available. And actually now there's three competing and very flourishing newspapers all trying to provide the same thing, but we would never have known it if we didn't carry out this intervention, um, this you know, proper monitoring. And I think the final point I'll make, because I know I'm short on time, is just that this monitoring in itself is so important for having men feeling included in um, the process. We've sort of talked already today about the problems that can happen if, if men are left out, if they're not having equally new opportunities provided for them. I mean, it's, it's important that this project, most projects, they're also trying to work in the sectors which men are going to benefit from. But just this actual act of sitting down and listening, I think, is something that we can neglect when it comes to men because we're so focused on also having the women's uh, side of the story. So, yeah, those are my um, few points. And uh, I... Thank you, Eleanor. You raised a few interesting things that I might come back to in questions later. Um, and now I'd like to invite um, Julianne from IFAD to provide her presentation. Thank you very much. My name is Juliana Friedrich. I'm coming from IFAD and in IFAD from the Policy and Technical Advisory Unit, uh, mainly responsible um, for promoting nutrition-sensitive agriculture and rural development. Now, as a nutritionist, you're always in a fix when you are dealing with agriculture production and rural development because, first of all, you have to um, explain that nutrition security doesn't equal food security. So production doesn't mean automatically need, uh, mean that um, you will have a better nutrition outcome. This is one point. And then if you take the challenge to marry nutrition and gender, it becomes even more complicated. Because um, at the moment, in a lot of cases, we still have this idea of working in silos. Meanwhile, nutrition and gender is, uh, are considered as cross-cutting. And in the beginning, I thought cross-cutting is something nice, because whatever you are doing, you have to take care of gender and nutrition. Meanwhile, I'm getting more and more the, the kind of idea, cross-cutting means you don't want to deal with it, just put it somewhere. Um, we don't have a real home, so you have to create your home. And um, in nutrition, you're always somehow torn between health and agriculture. And depending in which country you are, what kind of policy the country has, uh, you feel uh, neglected by health or you feel neglected by agriculture. And one point is, if we don't see it, um, that those things are belonging together, um, we are in a fix. I take the opportunity not to to follow what I had in mind, but uh, to, to get you on my journey, which I did this morning when I heard some of the speakers and some of the, the comments made. And I would like to refer to them because I, I think this is my thinking and this is food for thought. I'm not coming up with solutions. Our keynote speaker in the morning put it very, very clear that the big credit is for the men and the microfinance is for the women. You have the same story in nutrition. You will have the big irrigation um, projects for the men, mainly, and you have the small kitchen gardens for the women. The men are dealing with income and food production, and the women are dealing with consumption. This is one of the major challenges we have already in this way. 
um, because it also means that you are reducing the potential really to do something on consumption because if you don't give particular interest and um, also input in kitchen garden, you will not have the success and the output you could actually do with the kitchen garden. So I'm just coming from a, from a mission where everybody was telling me, oh, you know, kitchen garden, they're not working out, they're not bringing anything. Of course they're not bringing anything. If you don't deal with inputs, if you don't deal with uh, seed, with water and so on and so forth. So this is one of the mar marginalization of gender plus nutrition and you will find it everywhere. There was a comment on, is it not too much work now to deal with dietary diversity at the home? No, it's not too much work because we're going back to a system we are coming from. The dietary diversity was never an issue and neither child under nutrition in the way we have it now was an issue. But now with really reducing this diversity, it's, it's really bringing us uh, more and more in trouble. And besides, I think it's more costly and um, time consuming if you have to go with your child to the doctor instead of um, putting some vegetable on the table. Um, these are some of the things. Um, we were talking about youth. We have achieved already a situation where uh, sex disaggregated data for adults are very common. So you distinguish between men and women, adults, but if it comes to youth, all of a sudden you find them in one pot. And I think we have a problem here. Um, one of my before speakers was talking about particularly young men to be involved. I'm going in the different direction and I would like to put really a bit of emphasis on the situation of young women. The places I'm working are the places I'm doing my reality check because as a policy advisor you're always in, in a very nice environment. You can say and you can develop whatever you think is right, but the reality check comes when you're going on mission. And if you look at a lot of countries, mainly sub-Saharan countries, but um, in Asia it's not really different, you will find a lot of very, very young women, let's say 15, 14, um, having their first child, maybe the second one is coming. And this is uh, compromising, again, gender as well as nutrition. First of all, we all know that, or as a nutritionist, you should know that uh, the moment a young, very young woman is delivering a baby. The chance that you get a low birth weight baby with less than 2.5 kgs is very high and this is one of the major risk factors for undernutrition. So it starts there already. Besides, those women, of course, um, they are no longer in school. The moment they are pregnant, they're getting out of school. So the whole potential in terms of being empowered by being also able to negotiate, being able to to learn, to, to do something different is actually taken away. So there are a lot of issues where you cannot separate between nutrition and gender. It belongs together throughout. But it also belongs to the rest. I was just coming um, from a road. So we looked at the road and then the engineer was telling me, you don't ask me to look at gender, are you? Yes, I do, because there are some issues involved, which has something to do with nutrition. The moment you have hard work, you definitely increase the requirement for your nutri nutrients. But you also have to look in which way could this road maybe assist women to have access to markets and how are they involved in the decision making, where this road should be, what kind of quality and so on and so forth. So whatever you are doing, you have this angle of nutrition and gender. And um, I hope you're asking questions, so I think I'm the only one who's now closing in time. Uh, thanks for your attention. <laughs> I'm sure the audience will get back to you with many questions. And now um, to our final speaker, and then um, we will have um, some questions among ourselves, and then we'll open it to the floor. Uh, and now we have Osa from the UN. So my name is Osa Torkelson. I'm the Economic Empowerment Advisor from UN Women, uh, the regional office for Eastern and Southern Africa. UN Women is the newest UN entity. We were born in 2010 with a mandate to promote gender equality and women's empowerment in, in the UN system. So is this good? Yeah? 
Uh, so we are, can't do that obviously alone. Uh, we are partnering with many of you. Uh, that's the whole uh, idea of our, our, uh, of our uh, mandate. And so, how are we working in the agricultural sector? I wanted to start and invite you to look around this room, and I found it very interesting the way the division of work has been illustrated, and this must have been, you know, many hundreds of years ago, uh, on the murals in this particular room. Women and men were working together, and we can only see the harvesting phase and a little bit on the production in the agriculture, but we can see that the traditional uh, division of work between women and men in agriculture has very old roots. If we would have had some murals over there, we might have been able to see what happened when, when these produce got to the market. And then we could have another mural talking about who does what in the household. Because I think what the current problem is, and particularly in smallholder agriculture, in, in a challenging situation such as that confronting Eastern and Southern Africa, is that not only is there a division of work, but currently we really do see an overwhelming majority of farms run by women. And we are talking about 50 to 60 percent de facto run by women. Now you have to add to that, uh, and here we are coming to an enigmatic situation, because on top of that, and we heard uh, Professor Gosh talking about it, you are adding the unpaid work, which falls 100% on women and children. And on top of, top of that, you have to add to this equation the, 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 the limited access to resources. So what does this produce in terms of a stifling situation? We have heard about the productivity blocks and the ways productivity is really constrained by this really fundamental imperfection that someone is doing all the job but has no access to the resources, in addition, doesn't have access to the information necessary to improve, and I can say her a lot, because this is, you know, uh, uh, broadly speaking, the case. So we see a situation with results on agricultural productivity, which is slowed down in a smallholder situation, we also see incredible figures of food losses uh, driven by post-harvest imperfections, the way crops are dealt with when they are being harvested, which could, but we need more research, could probably be attributed to gender dim dimensions in, in the households and women's limited access to the technologies needed. I saw World Bank studies saying that we are registering about four billion of food losses per annum in Eastern and Southern Africa. Uh, so these are huge amounts, and someone said, we had a recent chauffeur, that this is equal to the whole amount of food aid spent in the continent for, for one year. I mean, this is a massive, explosive piece of information. But for women, what, what does this enigma lead to in addition? I'm calling it elsewhere Cinderella paradox, and it looks a little bit maybe luxury, because Cinderella couldn't go to the ball because there were peas thrown on the floor all the time. So it wasn't that she wasn't invited. She was welcome to come. But unfortunately, she had to complete all these millions of tasks. And whenever they were completed, there was a new bucket pulled out for her, right? And there is no miracle for rural women. So that means there is no representation of women's voices in decision-making bodies. Because how on earth? Would there be time to participate? And that means that in its implication and par conséquence, very little of this structural problem is actually likely to change unless we fix some of these very serious bottlenecks, right? So yesterday I had the privilege to, to, uh, to participate in the NEPAD presentation of an incredible program. And I was so happy and I saw that there was so much progress happening. And one example is that the annual General Assembly for the Global Donor Platform for Rural Development is actually dedicated to gender. This is great. And there is a huge NEPAD program, and there is so much happening. And then again, I was seeing the glasses a little bit, you know, half empty, because there is still so much to do. And we have been discussing this morning about setbacks and, and things going backwards. 
And I'm just feeling also in my work that I'm very tired because I still have to do actually a lot of convincing and a lot of, you know, nagging, um, convincing, and then, you know, you think you have an agreement, you think you really succeeded in a negotiation, and next moment that program is gender blind. Or next moment, that policy, which you believed you had really a convincing, you know, negotiation, successful outcome, this is the, the right thing to do. And someone said the smart thing to do. But then anyhow, you know, it really didn't happen. So I was going to dedicate the last few minutes on, on, on what we as UN women are doing to reverse these changes. So what we think that we need to do, and we think that we need to do just, you know, people are saying we need to look outside of the box. I really don't think so. I think we need to look inside the box, and we should be in that box together. Uh, and we should really look at what we have, and we should just be more serious in, in making these things happen. Because uh, we really know what we need to fix the situation. We need changes at the policy level. We need uh, changes in the rules of the financial game because still there are some bottlenecks to women even accessing loans which could un unlock their, their locked positions. And there are just, you know, some tiny things but with a lot of negotiation that could come. So that's part of the work that we do, trying to fix these rules of the game through engaging with the right partners, right? The other thing is I think still the evidence is needing, needed so right now we are working with the World Bank and also with the United Nations Environmental Program on a study costing the gender gap in agriculture under different investment scenario using data from Malawi and Kenya and, and uh, Tanzania. So we want to really bring the case to policymakers. So if you fix some of these policy options, what is it going to bring to your economy in terms of the growth? We want to give them the, the, the hard figures. So we believe that we need this upstream. Please, and uh, now, that's terrible. Was I so carried away? That's, that's good news. I still have the passion. So let me at least, uh, before I end, I have to tell you that we did a share fair for rural women's technologies. Please, will you allow me? Because I think that was a great thing we did. We need to fix things upstream and downstream. Uh, so what we did was to make an inventory of all the different technologies, uh, post-harvest, value addition, uh, there is so little going on. We got all the innovators coming to Nairobi in a broad partnership with the UN, UN Rome-based agencies. The information is, is out there and please contact me again. And now we are moving into the upscaling of these particular technologies. So that's what we are excited about, and to fix the bottlenecks around the technology upscaling. Sorry about taking. Okay. And uh, thank you, Osa. It's hard to follow on from that, but um, I'll try. Um, so now, um, I thought that one thing, trying to stay within the box, as you, you talked about, Osa, is that I wanted to talk about, um, I'll just have one quick question, because I'm, I'm up here, and then I'll open it to the floor. But my one quick question is, um, we're talking a bit also about um, partnerships and, and how we can use partnerships to further our work. And something that struck me about what Eleanor said is about um, the work with newspapers about how you know, it was so important that women actually saw examples of, of um, work that other women were doing to inspire them. It's kind of like a, the positive deviance kind of thing. So I was wondering whether um, other speakers had thoughts on, on new opportunities for partnerships that we might have in our work. Now just to mention one, we are working with the Equity Group Foundation in Kenya precisely to change the rules of the financial game, negotiating with them ways. Other partners within uh, country offices of UN Women is working with Central Bank to try to see if you can moderate the instructions that central banks are then given to, 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 uh, to financial sector overall, so that's one. Yes, uh, 
We are also uh, actually published a partnership of uh, African researchers, so we work in partnership with the NGOs as well as the private seed companies, uh, who, in, especially when it comes to the private seed companies, they contract women to produce seed, uh, as well as the NGOs, in most of them, they have also these uh, facilities where uh, women access uh, loans through the village saving. Uh, this is one of the initiatives that is being done by the Catholic Relief Services in Malawi. And the women are able to access loans and they have also formed cooperatives. And by forming cooperatives, they are able to access loans uh, at the banks. So that is just one uh, example. Um, well, maybe one, one example from our side. I mentioned that uh, climate change, of course, is uh, a big issue in, in the work which uh, we are conducting. And um, we have supported to set up a, a partnership, which is again in itself, it's a public-private partnership initiative with several coffee companies. Uh, with CEDA, IDH, to work on climate change and sustainable coffee production. And in this context, we are now assessing the issue of, of gender and climate change. And we have started to, to work on this in order to then develop an, an approach which we can implement uh, hands-on with the coffee communities um, we are working with. Thank you. Um, I might now open the questions to the floor. Yes, uh, a brief question. No one in particular, but uh, a couple of interventions, they, they, they touched that issue. Um, I personally, I strongly believe in science, technology, and the importance of data. But I heard again about studies. Don't we know enough to action, to act? Uh, do, I mean, it's not, again, asking for study when we have a strong body of evidence, a way to postpone real commitment in what we know that we should be doing. Thank you. So I'm Alison Brody from the RDS, um, from a program called Bridge, which is a gender and development program. And it was just a, just a comment, really, that um, I, we appreciate the, the focus on women's empowerment and women's economic empowerment. That's obviously really important to recognise women's existing and, and potential economic agency and productive capacity. Um, but I think it's really important to realise that economic empowerment is part of a bigger story of empowerment of women. And, and it's really important not to stop with economic empowerment. And Asa Asa <laughs> um, touched on this, um, that even if women do have more access to um, productive resources and money, um, that may translate into improved nutritional outcomes for their family, but it doesn't necessarily translate into improved power within the family for, for women and, and at the, um, the local, the national, the community level, um, in terms of decision making, in terms of the kinds of choices women can make over their lives and livelihoods, um, in terms of whether or not gender-based violence is reduced, and so I think we need to constantly come back to this issue of how we're defining empowerment, what do we mean by empowerment, and, and to really ensure that interventions are transformative in, for, in terms of achieving gender equality and women's rights and constantly come, to, come back to that question. So do we know already in the bigger empowerment capital levels? I mean... In IFAD, we definitely try to, to go the economical pathway, um, really to, to get women into business, um, making sure that at least 30% of the, the projects are actually dealing with women. Nevertheless, the question is then 30%, is that a good figure? Is that enough? Should it be 50%? Should we deal with figures at all? Um, empowerment for me as a nutritionist always I had a statement that um, if you empower a woman, either you hit the woman or you hit the child. Because we, we look at women very often as a kind of neutral, um, a neutral person. But um, one, of the, one of the speakers were saying that the kind of 
um, time-consuming activities women have to do in top, on top of what we would like them to, to participate in, to, to get empowered. Unless we are looking at this point, how to reduce this type of, of workload and time-consuming activities, it will be very, very difficult. And for me, still empowerment, for me personally, it starts with education. The moment you have a society with 80% of women being illiterate, you have a problem. It will be very, very difficult to empower them in a, in a meaningful way that they really are able to, to be on their own. And I hope I'm not misunderstood. But um, also if it comes to nutrition, um, we still have to, to know who is actually under control or on, off the control, how to spend money. Who's able to say, okay, this child or this woman has to go for an antenatal clinic? Uh, who is able to, to send somebody for malaria treatment? Who is able to decide that um, even a little, I know there are some vegetarians here, but still um, looking at stunting, uh, even a little um, animal source protein would be really helpful to address stunting. And we have countries where every second child is chronically undernourished. And this is not only uh, something bad for the child, it's, it's bad for the whole uh, society, for the whole nation. You will have really losses in terms of mental development and uh, productivity gains. So um, for me, empowerment, yes, we have to, de we have to define it. Um, I'm dealing with proxies, but the moment you have already a gap in education and uh, early pregnancies, you, we have to face it. Huh? I wanted to address the two questions in one. Actually, we had a question about don't we have enough data, which is an incredibly interesting uh, remark. Because don't we know that it's good to practice and move your body at least half an hour every day? Don't we know that it's not good to smoke? Don't we know that it's good to eat healthy food? Don't we know many of these things? And still, you know, what's the psychological bottleneck to our inability to live according to what we know is good for us, and in this case, you know, is good for development. So if, you know, if there was an opportunity and if there is scope for us to throw a question back to the groups, two and two working to ask ourselves, if we know that this is, you know, great and, you know, the best thing to do, the smart thing to do, then why on earth is it not being done, right? So, good question. For me, I attribute it a little bit to the stickiness of the issue. And that is where I get to the empowerment question, because we've seen that, yes, economic empowerment of women can actually lead to backlash in households. And we have now the 16 days of activism regarding gender-based violence to eliminate that. But it's still a serious issue in many households, so we have to deal with that as well. So I think many of the stickinesses really are attributed and we need men on board. We are hearing that a lot. Uh, we have a campaign called the He for She, which you may have heard of and you may want to familiarize yourself with it. So that really going back to the murales, it's really gender equality is about working together to, to improve uh, uh, the, the, the situation. Yeah. I just wanted to uh, say one quick thing on the issue of um, women's economic empowerment because, I mean, certainly we're all very aware that, you know, that that's only one part of the picture of empowerment and all of the projects which I'm talking about or working with are nested within, you know, governance issues, local community issues, trying to create women's groups and so on. And like also said, we also know that women's economic empowerment isn't always uh, without its problems, but I think it's just quite important to keep in mind that, I mean, it's really true when people are living in very, very hard economic situations and they do actually believe, I mean, this is quotes from, from people that I've worked with, this, this is really, they believe that women cannot provide for the family, they don't believe that they have the capacity to do it. That type of economic empowerment, along with all of the other things we need to address, is, is really critical just to the value that we place on women and what we think they can achieve. So I, I, I think it's important not to underestimate that. 
Uh, I just want to add on why uh, more research when we have uh, a lot of data. I think for those who participated in yesterday's discussion uh, on NEPAD, I think participatory is very, very important, especially uh, for us in Africa. Uh, we know that there is data out there, but normally there is that feeling of saying, uh, I think they did it, it doesn't apply to us, it applies uh, to, to them, you know, the people who did the research. But when we take a participatory approach, uh, where they are involved from the beginning, uh, they own the data and they are more much willing uh, to take up uh, whatever uh, outcomes that comes from that uh, research. So that's why uh, you see that we are doing more research uh, to allow that the people can own uh, what are the findings and they will be more uh, willing uh, to participate uh, in the interventions. Yeah, briefly on the empowerment um, question. Um, I would say that in, in our approach we, we focus, um, I mean, we focus really on joint decision making within the households. And, and when we do that, um, well, there, there are some methodological steps, so we're working with men and women. We start with, with couple seminars, so-called couple seminars, um, to, to guide the, these couples to a process of self-reflection about how is their situation, how is um, this power structure, access to resources, decision making taking place, which are the problems they are facing, etc. And they are very concrete problems that they are facing. Women, for example, we discovered um, they, they are selling part of the coffee just at the lowest price possible to get some cash because the men wouldn't give this cash to the women. It's, it's just amazing and it's a widespread problem actually. So through this discussion, through this self-reflection, these couples, they realize it doesn't make any sense to work against each other or to hide things from each other and not to, to put the heads together, plan jointly, exchange and take the decisions jointly. And this is what, what is happening and there I would say the, the empowerment it focuses, while focusing in first place on, on economic issues, because there, there lies a great potential and also incentive to, to go into this process and, and to, to make these changes on a household level, I, th I have the impression in, in our communities that this empowerment is going beyond, beyond um, this, this economic dimension. But this is what I was saying. We, we have to understand this more. We are, we are trying to assess it. We are learning while doing this work. Thank you, George. It's coffee as an entry point for broader women's empowerment, really. Yeah. Okay. Um, could I have the next round of quick questions? Um, oh, okay. Thank you, Mila. Um, okay. Uh, really, I want to respond to Mauro's question first, because Asa gave us uh, the, the permission to, to respond to the, to the question. Do we know enough? You see, for example, our organization, 79 countries. We work with all the ministries of agriculture in 79 countries. We are the largest knowledge database on ACP agriculture. And you'd be surprised at how little knowledge there is on gender and agriculture. In particular, we may know enough of the challenges, but on the solutions, you know, that it works, that it makes sense, we don't know enough. Either it's, you know, best practices, they are there, and we, we've had so many examples today. But, but they're not, they are, they are either not contextualized, uh, you know, or they're too small scale to be able to transpose uh, to transpose it and generalize in, in all these countries, you see? And so, but, I, you know, our question is always, I mean, when we, when we uh, solicit funding ourselves, nobody wants to invest in the evidence building, in that upscaling of best practices, evidence building. It's always part of a broader knowledge management and learning strategy, well, you know, and then, of course, percentage of percentage of percentage of something and it becomes very lost or you know and so nobody actually invests in the upscaling of evidence and the upscaling of, uh, of best practices and uh, of course 
if we are here to make solutions, uh, to find solutions as well today. Uh, that's one thing we would recommend on is invest in the evidence and the knowledge. Thank you. Investment and evidence building. Uh, I'll have two more quick questions. My question is for Julia, for Julian, Asa and Rhoda. I have found your panel particularly inspiration. <laughs> Get a lot of inspiration out of it. I'm working myself for a European Commission funded platform on agricultural research for development. And I think the share fair for rural women's technologies, which was held in Nairobi, was exciting because as donors we tend to miss out a lot which is happening under the radar. Now when you go to women's technologies and the upscaling problem then we are confronted with banks willing to invest in upscaling and then I see that Julian said the problem is that microcredit is for women bigger finance schemes are for men and then Rhoda said rightly to increase the credit worthiness of women, we have to make sure they are willing to reinvest into their business. Now, this is a problem. So how, what type of advice would you give us to make this happen? It's a very big dilemma. Thank you, I'm Lynn Brown. I wanted to come back to the issue of education and empowerment because, don't get me wrong, I believe in female education, but what is female education? When I went to school, I actually went to an all-girls school in England. I had no access to engineering, technical drawing, very limited science, but I had very good access to home economics training. So what is the education system that's being promoted? I lived for two years in Bangladesh and it's one of the countries that's probably made the most major progress on girls' education. But there was actually a large-scale survey done there and, and the way the society works, you expect women to be more empowered as they age and particularly when they become mothers-in-law, they have a little more decision-making ability. So I looked at this survey and I thought, okay, what I expect to see now is an equalization between young women and older women. Older women are empowered because they're older. Younger women are more empowered because they're educated. That's actually not what I saw at all. You know, young women still were not empowered coming out of school. Young women were still more likely to accept domestic violence as being okay and perfectly good if they didn't do certain things. So, I mean, I think part of the problem is it's not just educating girls, but it's showing an education system is not reinforcing uh, a gender construct in society that you're actually trying to address. So it's also we have to change the way girls are educated in school. Yes. Hi, my name is Edmi Kim. I'm from South Korea at uh, our women's university. It used to be the largest until about two years ago where I'm from Iwa Women's University. Um, just following up on that, I've noticed in Korea, which is a very strong uh, male dominant society for a very, very long time, uh, we've had almost equal education access for women. We now have women in the labor force in large numbers, but in terms of wage gap, we're still the worst among the OECD countries and not doing quite well. We're about, uh, women earn about 60% of what men earn, and we're the 15th largest economy, but the gender inequality index, we're I think 111th out of 135 countries that were uh, reviewed. So I think uh, educating women employment and empowerment do not necessarily you know have a positive relationship you have to work at each and every stage in order to move from education to employment and then to empowerment and the empowerment part has been the most challenging for us and we haven't attained that Um, maybe just on education. I guess we could easily fill a whole week with a discussion about education. 
And if I'm bluntly talking about education, there are different levels I'm looking at. And it starts with formal uh, literacy classes somewhere in a village where women are telling me later on that uh, they're very happy to be part participating in this, this literacy classes because now they can go to a market, can sell their products and they can follow up the calculation. I mean, you have to, to, you have to swallow that. They have been cheated all their, their, their life because they were not able to count two and two together. This is one part of the education. If I'm looking at nutrition, we know the better a woman is educated, the more healthier, the more nutrition um, well um, a child will be. These are, these are evidence-based things we know already. But it's a long, you know, it's a long story and has different levels and has different things. So starting from literacy classes for four months up to university, everything is, is part of it. Um, and I would also like to look at the scaling up. I think the scaling up is one of our major problems. We have a lot of island solutions and we have very small paradises, but to, to scale up first of all, definitely you need um, a very, very strong commitment of a government. Without a government, nothing is possible. And if you look at the Sun Initiative, for example, I, I still think we are not very far, but we have done a step in the right direction. So there is still a lot to do. But at least if I'm going in a mission and we are dealing with governments, I can get them on their own signature. I can tell them, guys, you have been committed yourself to, to address stunting, so please do it. And these would be some of the, the answers we have. So just very short answers to that. Ada has more time. And uh, I have also short uh, answers to, to you. I, and I also want to thank you because the European Union was actually contributing to the share fair via FAO, which was amazing. There were so many partners on board of this initiative. It could never have happened unless everyone was contributing a little. No one was contributing a lot, so it was great. Uh, what can we do to upscale? I think you are very right. Uh, regarding the many, many uh, challenges that need to be addressed to do this in a good way. So my advice would be, you were asking for my advice, to study the situation and what it takes. So we have, we learned a lot uh, through the share fair. We had policy dialogues, four of them, during the three days, and many issues came out. 400 people, stakeholders from the region and elsewhere attended. So we have so many lessons learned from that. We have lessons learned also on what it takes to work together, many partners, which we're also going to uh, be fully drawing from. So what we are proposing initially is really to establish a technology promotion group to scrutinize very thoroughly using criteria, including, of course, affordability, um, and, and manufacturability, uh, patent rights. There are so many issues. I think we have 12 of them listed, and I would be very pleased to share the concept note with you, obviously. Um, so this is the plan now, to study the situation and then use the technology promotion group to identify a strategy for upscaling, which is really taking all the different issues, you know, the broader ones, into consideration robustly. Uh, thank you. Um, okay. Similarly, we have uh, uh, piloted uh, but with using about 10 women uh, in the community that we are working so that we are able to uh, study and uh, find out how best uh, we can uh, improve. And already it is coming out, the business skills in these women is very limited. Most of the time they just know how much they have uh, bought the materials and how much uh, they have uh, sold. They really don't look at the cost uh, as such. <laughs>